Okay, guys, it is 7.05, so we're ready to rock. Um, all right, so first of all, thank you for coming to the first Bloom General Meeting. Can you raise your hand if you were here yesterday for the general, general, general meeting? Okay, I see. It's like almost half and half. It's pretty cool. Okay, well, uh, basically the point of today's meeting is just we're going to tell you about balloons. We're going to go a little bit more in depth than yesterday for those of you who did talk to us. We're going to talk about the team as a whole, uh, what you will do in the team, what a balloon is, you know, how that stuff works. Um, we're going to talk about our plans for like the year, so you can figure out what you want to get involved with. And we're going to talk about like the next launch, which is in like 11 days, which is like what you'll be involved in if you choose to join. I'll talk about kind of what you'll do. So in a second, we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, you, if we're going to remain mysterious for those of you who haven't met us yet. Uh, in a second. But before we do, um, yesterday there was a video that Paul played from his like laptop instead of like through the room. So now there's actual volume. I will play this full video. I was going to say promo video because I made it and it's really cool. So. <laughs> So that's, that's a tie, right? It's really cool. Yeah! Yeah! I don't know if you're clapping because that side is cool it's or my video is cool, but either one, right? So, um, Okay, so we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Curl Saffin. I've met some of you and I've not met others, and I look forward to meeting all of you guys. Um, so our information is on the screen. And I'm just getting out for shop. The other cool lead. Yeah, so our emails and phone numbers are yeah. here if you want to take them right now. Uh, so basically, like, do you plan to actually join balloons and stay really long term? Uh, there's going to be a lot of communication like all the time. So if you ever need to reach out to us for help within balloons, or if uh, we reach out to you, we're going to make sure that'll be easy. Um, but for now, if you are sure you're going to be in balloons and you want to like take our information right now, uh, do it. Okay, uh, if you want. Okay, all right. So um, for the next thing, now that we've introduced ourselves, um, we're going to do a little quick room introduction stuff. Me and Spinner will start. Uh, say these things. I know it's kind of like a oh no, we got to do this, but yeah. So I'll start, Carl Safin, I'm a sophomore. My intended major is mechanical engineering with a minor in electrical engineering. My fun fact is that, my fun fact last year in my freshman dorm was that I drank 10 cups of tea a day, which was true, and now I've stopped, and now I drink five cups of coffee a day. <laughs> and what would I launch in a balloon? It's kind of a long story, but I'm taking a silversmithing class in winter in the PRL, and I want to make a necklace that's of the Cassiopeia constellation and launch it on a balloon so I can say that like, this is in space, and it's like about space, and it's going to be a gift for somebody. So that's what I want to launch in a balloon. Yeah, um, my name is Iskander. I am a senior. I'm also a grad student apparently because I'm co-terming. <laughs> and yeah, electrical engineering, which is a very cool major, and you guys should talk to me if you're considering EE. And fun fact, I'm also a fellow tea addict, just like Will. I'm not at 10 yet, but I'm <laughs> You shouldn't get there. <laughs> Probably not, but, and, oh. Well, there's so many things, but I don't know. These days, I want to like put a DSLR in a balloon and make a poor man's bubble. Get some cool pictures of you know, stars. Cool. So I think what we'll do is we'll go around the table and then we'll go around the room. So let's start with you. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you guys for introducing yourselves. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Okay. 
that took a while, which is unfortunate, but this is, now we all know each other a little bit better. So happy that there's so many of you. Yes, we're so glad there's so many of you. So even though it took a while, it was awesome. So now, we'll begin with our exciting PowerPoint, which I was doing until 3 in the morning, so please, appreciate it. Um, so let's, keep, let's go. Uh, agenda. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So, first of all, balloons. What are those? So we're going to deal with what that is. Uh, then we're going to talk about something called Val Bell. So like, what is that? Right? And we'll deal with that. Um, then we're going to talk about launches. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get what this means soon. There's a lot of trucks, a lot of fun. there's a lot of steam rooms. It's very fun. Um, then we're going to talk about how you guys can get involved. I don't know who's going to get this reference, uh, but if you do, then awesome. Uh, if you don't, just don't ask me about it. Um, so then there's basically, obviously there's different components in here. There's stuff for mechanical engineers, for electrical engineers, for computer scientists. So basically we'll filter you into those categories. Uh, if you like hitting things with hammers when you're a kid, you're probably a mechanical engineer. If you shoved forks into outlets, you're probably an electrical engineer. Um, and then if your news resolution was 1920 by 1080, you're probably a computer scientist. And so basically, after all that, hopefully you'll find something you like, and you'll become balloon tick. It's like balloon ticks are buzzed, but it's burst, because, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so this is what we're going to go over. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so this is what we're going to go over, um, and it's will be exciting. <laughs> um, we'll have a lot of time. So basically, we're going to be talking. But whenever there's a question, please raise your hand like through any point, any time during the PowerPoint. Because if you don't raise your hands, there might be a question we just won't be able to answer because you didn't raise your hand. So just always ask the stuff because this is as much presentation as a dialogue. Yes. But Kirill, what if I'm not M E C S or E E? I don't know. <laughs> we will. <laughs> if you have particular interest in balloons, whatever it is, you can talk to us, and we will definitely find a place where you can do something for balloons. You know, this isn't. This is a technical team, technically, with SSI. There's three technical teams, and we're one of those. But the reality is, there's always something you can do, and we'll talk about a lot of opportunities that are available, and maybe something will pique your interest. If nothing piques your interest, but you want to be part of this team, just talk to Mary Skinder. There is definitely something for you to yeah. do. But we already have like projects for the record for chemists. Bio oh yeah, and material scientists. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of projects for Most like. Most of our stuff falls into this category, but yeah, we'll, right. we'll yeah. do something. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, no questions so far? Okay. So, what is a healthy balloon? I have. Anybody have any idea? Good. All right, so. <laughs> is that a have? Anybody tell me? Oh, no, it's not. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a have? Good in space, right? That's not how it works either. No. So, this is what a real balloon looks like. These are pictures from actual SSI launches from last year. Uh, they're fucking huge. If you see, right, that's us, that's the balloon. Uh, that one's a little bit smaller, but it's pretty big. Um, we'll talk more in depth about what uh, balloons are in a few slides. But the idea is they're very, 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 very big balloons, a lot of gas, and they fly very high. That's yeah. for now, <laughs> right? Um, so before we talk about balloons, we want to talk a little bit about like the environment that they reach, like what's near space like, because basically, uh, there's a few different fronts of space, right? You can be launching satellites, and that's like, ooh, like 500 kilometers above the Earth. You can be launching rockets, which go to like, you know, that height. Um, or you can be launching balloons, which go as high as you can at like that kind of cost. So a little bit about near space. So balloons fly to around 100,000 feet. 140,000 is the highest limit, right? Yeah, for, for like an amateur group, 140 was the record. 140 is the record. Most of our stuff flies at 80,000, 100,000. Right, so basically around that height, just to kind of uh, fit, configure yourself, at that height, air density is 4% of what it is here. I don't know, that, that's basically like nothing, so very little It's like bit. almost Mars, actually. Yeah, like it's actually very close to like yeah. Mars kind of atmosphere, there's like nothing there. So air density is 4%, temperature is damn cold. So it's like negative 40, negative 60 C, so it's chill, it's really cool. <laughs> um, the pressure is 2.7% of that at sea level, so it's, I, I don't know how to make a joke about this, but it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, Winds can get ridiculously high or ridiculously low, so things happen. Uh, there's like ideal days when they're like really ridiculously fast in a certain direction, and some days where they're just not doing anything. It depends on like the time of the year and what your other atmospheric magic. Exactly. So, example, like this time of the year until like February is like the most easterly powerful winds in like the Gulf Stream. This is a great time to like launch stuff eastward. But it's just kind of thing. Um, so basically, too long didn't read. Very cold. Very pressurized. Very thin. Very fast. Very serious business. Very, mm -hmm. very cool. Um, and then also, why does this matter? Well, because the engineering problems dealing with balloons usually deal with basically the fact that it's, there's no air, or the temperature's really low, or pressure's really low. Those are problems. So, electronics fail negative 20 C, most of them, right? So that's kind of toughy because it's colder than negative 20 C, like always. Um, the rest fail negative 40 C, like for sure, okay? <laughs> um, maybe a few go past that, right? Um, 
Batteries just <laughs> don't work after negative 10 C. Like, they're just done. The chemical reactions just stop working. For lithium batteries, at least. Um, and payloads be flying at very high speeds. That might be a consideration, maybe. Okay, so, little picture here. Um, is that a, a yeah. vulture? So vulture's flying at 11 kilometers. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so vultures fly at airplane altitude. Not know that, okay. Um, bacteria, amoebas just fly around at 40 kilometers. No. <laughs> um, but, but balloons fly here. It's us. <laughs> right, so we fly pretty damn high, about uh, three times the height of an airplane is the highest a balloon basically goes, because planes fly about 30,000 feet. So around 90,000 is like the maximum we're going to. Um, this gives you some kind of scale of that. It also has some like temperatures here, so like, that's already pretty cold. Um, that's that's really that's that's warmer. Oh yeah, just whatever. Atmosphere is weird. But we fly in a really cold area. Um, not quite as high as rockets, and not quite as high as clouds, I guess. But higher than vultures, which is a plus. So. <laughs> now we'll talk about latex. That was creepy. Latex. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about latex balloons. <laughs> Right. They start as cheap as eight dollars, but they go up to four hundred dollars. Is which is no big deal, right? That's pretty affordable. Um, they classify by their weight, and you learn more about this. So a really small balloons, thirty grams. Uh, if you saw the activities fair, yeah, we had a little balloon fly around. Yeah, that was thirty gram balloon that Iskander bought. There is one balloon that's like as tiny as like ten grams. I don't know what you want to do with that. Um, I'm sure some of you thinks you've flown on that if you want. So thirty grams is like eight bucks. And they go up to 300 grams, 1200 grams, 1500 grams, 2000 grams. So 3000 gram balloons literally weighs three kilograms and it can lift, let's say 20 kilograms. It also has to lift itself, which is three kilograms. So it like lifts 17 of payload. Just to kind we'll of- We'll see use either 1200 or 1600. Yeah, so normally what we'll use, those pictures, this is like, I imagine like a 15, 1600. Do you remember what you used? It's a 1200 and the big one has a 3000. 12 one, that's a 3000? Yeah. 3, yeah. It's just so far away. It's <laughs> underinflated on yes. purpose. God, I got it, okay, cool. So that's that. UV degrades latex, which kind of sucks. Um, so basically, when latex flies in the sky and the UV like boom boom, uh, the latex eventually just breaks down and the balloon just like ah, and it falls out. Degrades <laughs> latex. Um, so the the balloons we'll generally use have like like this utmost lift of like 10 kilograms, but that involves putting like a lot of gas into it, like a lot of helium into it. And if you put a lot of gas into it, as an example, this balloon, then it'll burst earlier because it'll have. Um, It'll just expand so much and overcome the elasticity of the latex that it'll pop really early. But it can lift a lot. That balloon, 3,000, like they said, is underinflated. And what that means is it can expand and fly to a much higher altitude, but it can lift less. So there's some kind of compromise like that. Yeah. Um, they can be as big as 13 feet in diameter on the ground. If th a 3,000 gram nominally filled is 13 feet in diameter. Uh, the ones we normally go, uh, use are like six, seven feet in diameter, uh, approximately on the ground. So they're pretty big on the ground. Uh, when they're in the air, they get really, really big, like 40 feet, 50 feet. Yeah, they like expand like almost. They're like twice. really, really big, like bigger yeah. than this room big yeah, in the see. air. You never can see it though, so. Um, they're lifted by helium. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can also lift it by hydrogen, but hydrogen goes boom, boom, yeah, so we stop using it. Yeah, that. we don't do it anymore. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> we used to. We used to, and it's not like we don't use it because we don't want to, and we're scared, it's because Stanford's like, no. So, stop doing that. Um, and they burst, as I said, around 80,000 to 140,000 feet. So these are the balloons we use. Does anybody have any questions about latex balloons that I can help answer now? Yes? What are the main causes of bursting? Is it just inflation? Uh, the bursting, so the, basically, the, most people, the way most people use these is they launch them, they fly to altitude to the point as pressure decreases, you know, the gas expands from the balloon, and then overcomes the elasticity of the latex, and it just pops. Okay. So usually it just pop. However, like I said, UV does degrade latex. So if latex balloons fly for a long enough duration, like a few days, the latex will degrade the UV enough and it'll just kind of pop. So it'll pop early from degradation. And sometimes they just pop for no reason because Chinese quality. Yeah, <laughs> so we've ordered Chinese balloons, they just kind of like pop whenever they want. Um, there's also human error, obviously. <laughs> so one time, I, I guess it was funny to fly a floaty on a, on a balloon. And the floaty <laughs> expanded too much and like shards of floaty penetrated the balloon. <laughs> and it just premature detonation. Yeah. Uh, and it falls down. <laughs> I find a watch. Yeah. Okay, so we'll quickly go over this. It's not too important, so we're not going to too much time on it. About other balloon technologies. So latex is what we use, but there are different kinds of balloons. So for example, zero pressure balloons. Really cool. Uh, they vent gas automatically because physics does actually work in the end. Um, so basically, latex balloons, like I said, you seal it, it flies, it pops, it comes down. Um, but this one basically it vents gas at some point, 
and that caused it to equilibrate at a certain altitude automatically. So it's kind of a... It's just like a hot air balloon, actually. Like, the bottom part is, like, Right, open, yes. So, so the bottom of this balloon has an itself. opening, and the gas vents to equilibrate with the outside pressure. Yeah. Just like a hot air balloon, and that's what causes it to maintain altitude. Um, it's basically just a big garbage sack. Like, this is a zero pressure extent. balloon. It's like a big, clear plastic garbage bag. I, I mean, I don't know. That, so... <laughs> They can cost $1,000 for really lame ones to hundreds of thousands of dollars. This one is going to for free, but how much do you think it was going to cost? Like a thousand bucks? Yeah. A thousand bucks for that balloon. Um, the price will uh, vary in, uh, we'll tell you how high it can go, like for how long kind of thing. So most, more expensive balloons, longer, higher kind of thing. Um, and they can fly for a few days, but they need to drop ballast. So like me and Skinner said, it vents gas, which can cause it to equilibrate, uh, but basically when night comes and then the gas contracts and it comes down, it needs to drop ballast to maintain altitude. So basically this thing will do the gas venting, but you need to drop ballast if you want to not fall after one night. Makes sense? Any questions about zero pressure balloons? Won't be, yeah. Who does use zero pressure balloons? Not us. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people who use zero pressure balloons. For example, you'll see a lot of NASA payloads, uh, NASA tested like uh, things being carried on zero pressure balloons for a few days. Um, there's a lot of there's a number of amateur groups that do it. It's usually used for research. Yeah, there was like a there was like a telescope experiment which flew in like oh yeah northern, that. North, northern pole. They just had like a huge massive balloon and they just like flew, flew like a yeah. huge X-ray telescope. But basically like too expensive. For us. Yeah, so this one's like actually the smallest zero pressure you can possibly see. Normally these are so big that you need like four cranes to just like hold yeah. them and stuff. And they're like massive enormous. ones, absolutely. Yeah, this one's just like really small. Um, the other main technology is super pressure. Uh, which is a lot of money. Um, just it's we're never gonna afford it. Um, Google can. <laughs> Google can. Uh, they have a fixed volume using very material science voodoo stuff. So basically, the idea of this is like by maintaining its volume, it like is able to just like stay in altitude, just kind of chill there like forever. <laughs> it works just like you know how we have like the. I mean, if you think of like party balloons, you have like the latex ones, right? That they're like elastic, and you have the metal film ish ones that have like kind of some specific shape. These guys are like. Fancy how to version. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Essentially, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and if if you heard of Google Loon, I'm not sure if you guys have Google seen Loon, that, but yes. it's Google's like moonshot project for uh, providing internet across the globe, and they do use these types of balloons, but they right. can afford them because they're Google. Yeah. So these lift hundreds to thousands of kilograms, and they can like just carry that for like months at a time. Um, both of these also come with like additional problems because you got to actually deal with like. You know, legal legal stuff. So you kind of like talk to the FAA and be like, "I'm carrying thousands of kilograms of shit for months." So, got it. <laughs> That's hard. Um, yeah, we'll never get one. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to show you some pictures that were taken from actual SSI altitude balloons over the past two years, which are pretty cool. This is a picture of a balloon that is a latex balloon exploding, and you can see the shards. This is right at the point where the balloon just kind of exploded, and the box starts the box starts oh, yeah. falling down. This is like. Almost 100,000 feet, I believe. Yeah. Right, yeah, probably pretty close. So this is kind of like, this is the altitude you get to with a balloon. This is kind of a visual. And like, this is not, the, if you go back, this is not like. Uh, no, we'll go back. It's not the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not, this is like GoPro like lens magic, but if you go to the next one, oh. I mean, this is actually like. Pretty flat. Like, there's some curvature, and that's like actually like accurate. Guys, do you have to start to see some curvature? Do you have to flat? Those so. altitudes, yeah. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this one's looking down, obviously. Is that, uh, that's Chachilla, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is Chachilla. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this was, this, this was a uh, balloon that landed in like, uh, on, in like a, an orchard or something, and we didn't find it, it was getting dark, so we left. And then a farmer like called us, he's like, I found it. <laughs> he said, and so we, uh, Aria, he's a pilot, he got a plane, and he went kind of, and they got and retrieved it. So, this is Chachilla, we ate the place. Do <laughs> you have a question over that? Yes. What's the farthest that a balloon has like, Crash landed. For our launches? Yeah. Ah, we will get to that. It's a very interesting answer. <laughs> yes. People like okay with you just randomly dropping payloads in their yard. Right. Like, that's a, a that's a thing you should be worried about. So like the most reason find really, music, you know, most find their music. The reason that every day, you know. So. so for those of you who like are Californians, who's Californian? Alright, you guys all know what Central Valley is? Okay. Yeah. For those of you who aren't Californians, Central Valley is literally like to the east of the bay, basically past the mountains. Uh, it's just a bunch of farmland for like miles and miles and miles. So the reason we go to launch there is the probability of landing in this nothingness as opposed to this somethingness. So we try and avoid having our balloons um, hit anything. 
That said, if that's definitely a problem and you don't want this to hit anything, there's a lot of liability concerns to the point that Stanford has purchased this $10 million liability insurance to avoid problems with this. Um, but so yes, people don't like things falling on them. <laughs> we have parachutes, but like some like this time it failed, so we crashed that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. We don't. You don't usually like come to the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's not typical. <laughs> but yeah. Um, how do you like clean up the mess in things that have been dropped? In? I mean, they're oh, like small. So it, it usually, it's, 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 yeah, it just falls. Like our payload itself doesn't like disintegrate or anything. You just take it and like go. Yeah. And usually it hits like a few leaves. Like it's yeah. there's no cleanup. There's thirty, anything. so like they don't just like. Yeah. So, and there's this one, which is one of my favorite pictures. It just looks really cool. This is a day with no clouds, so it's really clear. This is Lake Central Valley. You can see all the farmland, uh, fake curvature, uh, the sun. So pretty cool. Uh, this is kind of another cool picture. Um, same thing. <laughs> these are the mountains, which, funny story, we had a balloon get lost in these at one point. Not fun. Wait, Kirill, what's that white dot? Oh, yeah, I totally forgot about this. I want to tell you guys this. Uh, thank you, Karina. Um, this was our first launch of the year last year for new members, aka I was a new member. So basically we launched two balloons simultaneously. That is literally our second balloon. So it's really cool. You can see the second <laughs> balloon from our first one. And in fact they landed just miles apart. So this year, and we'll talk more about it later, for our first launch we're launching three balloons. And so you'll probably be able to see them on the footage from each other, which is really cool. Um, yes. This one. Uh, this is from GSBC which for those of you guys who don't know it, which is probably everybody because it's not like a well-known thing, I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> GSBC is the Global Space Balloon Challenge. It's an international collaboration between several hundred high-altitude balloon teams that launch balloons during a specified two-week time span. And there's just basically you can compete to do certain amazing things. So there's like longest ground track, longest endurance, coolest experiment, things like that. The GSBC, it was like, there's about a thousand teams in it at this point. And the cool thing is SSI started GSBC two years ago and it was such a big deal that it spun off into a 501c3 nonprofit separate from SSI. And then last year, the guy was like, you guys want to take it back? And we're like, no, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so GSBC, if you want to look it up, that's that. This one's really cool. This was the flight from GSBC that year. The, one of the goals was to take a balloon selfie. So they flew two <laughs> balloons, and I took a picture from this balloon of that balloon. Yeah. There's yeah. a balloon here that you don't see. Yeah, like the camera was like attached to the balloon with the longer rope. Yeah, and that's actually like a Stanford flag and stuff. So that's pretty yeah, cool. That's another payload right here. And this was a, this was, what is it called? The Kinetic Impaler? Yeah. <laughs> a 10 foot carbon fiber. It was a fishing rod. Yeah, a 10 foot carbon fiber rod that definitely could have killed somebody. Yeah. If the parachute deployment had failed, which it did not, <laughs> it did not. I would like to point out it did not. <laughs> okay. Now, next, now we're going to talk about, we'll address your question about the longest, longest a balloon has gone from its destination by starting discussion about something called Val Val. So before I go into that, these are mission patches, which we have for every single launch. Everybody who attends the launch, their name gets put on the mission patch. The mission patch describes what happens at that launch. So this was the launch of SSI 19, 20, and 21. So each balloon has its own like identifier. Um, and the mission is called the lowest identifier, so SSI 19. Uh, basically, this was a mission uh, in the last quarter of last year, where we launched the Zero Pressure Balloon you guys saw earlier in the picture, um, Val Val, and then also a, we'll talk about it later, like a neutrally buoyant balloon. So we launched three balloons, that's a cool picture. And this one was, uh, we launched Val Val at the very, very, very end of the year last year. This was SSI 22, and this was successful in the mission of Val Val. And I'll tell you exactly what Val Val is in the next slide, not yet. Uh, but I just want to show you guys mission patches. They look cool? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Oh, you guys are okay, all right. <laughs> cool, so Val Val. So Val Val stands for Valve Ballast. The idea of that is that, um, so latex balloons, they rise, they pop, and then they fall down. So the idea is, how do you stop from popping? Well, you don't make it go too high up. And basically, the idea is that valve valve has a valve preventing gas from the balloon, and when you remove the gap, lifting gas, it you know, descends, and it has ballast for dropping, which makes it rise. So between ballasting and venting of gas, it's able to equilibrate at a given altitude. So SI-22, this is a picture of its ground track, Normally balloons fly for about two hours and pop and like 80 miles away. So normally they like launch here and land like here, and it went like, holy smokes, and it Canada. flew, flew to Canada, right? <laughs> so I get you to Canada. So this was a 23 something hour flight. Uh, it was the the first like very successful showing of Valbal, which was really awesome. What was not awesome <laughs> was that in Idaho we flew through a class three thunderstorm. Um, and so basically that had a lot of downdraft and that caused Val Val to spend a lot of battles getting through the thunderstorm 
but amazingly enough, like maintained altitude like in the middle of thunderstorm. Um, but it flew through that, and it ran out of ballast here, which is why it landed, because it ran out of ballast. It was like, oh no, and it fell down. <laughs> Following this, we got in a picture from a farmer. It was just his shoes and then Valbal on the ground. And he emailed it to us, and then we responded. We sent like five emails, like never replied. And then we like call his house, and then like his wife picked up, and then we're like, oh, tell your husband to talk to us. He's like, okay, and never calls back. Then we have other people like calling him, and then she picks up, and he's like, can, can I talk to your husband? She's like, no. So I think he just like kept it. Um, we could like see the GPS coordinates like change, and he's like driving around his farm and stuff. <laughs> it's just like in his back seat, like. It's like pickups, like drives around. <laughs> just like, like that's so, cool. But, you know. So that happens. So there goes a thousand dollars, right? <laughs> so here's a really cool chart demonstrating this. So this is the duration of the flight. If you look at all the way at the beginning, the black line is the altitude. So if you notice, the altitude is reasonably pretty level, right? So you can't maintain like perfect levelness, but that's pretty damn good. Um, so this line, it's orange, right guys? Yes. Okay, it's the orange line, um, that's the number of drops that Val Bell had to do in order to stay basically at its current altitude. So if you notice here, it didn't drop anything for like seven hours at a time, which is optimally how this works. The reason it kept dropping ridiculously large amounts of ballast here was because of the thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. So if it hadn't dropped that ballast, like that is a source, right? Yeah. yeah. Literally, it dropped like three times here and like five times here, but then like a million times there. So you can imagine if we didn't fly through the thunderstorm, this could have gone across the US, maybe across the world, whatever the case. It could have gone really far. And the venting worked really well. As you can see, it like didn't vent gas for long periods at a time, and then it did, and did, and did. So, really cool chart that shows how awesome this stuff works and how crappy thunderstorms are. So, yes. Next. Um, so basically, Andre, you want to stand up and just mention, uh, Andre will talk after this PowerPoint about Valbal, give you a little bit briefer on it. It's going to be like a 15 minute technical talk. Um, so right now I'm just going to talk, I'll, I'll show, show a few pictures of the valve. So I just want to introduce you. Um, so Andre will talk about this very in depth afterwards. This is a valve. That's all I, I should say. I should steal this picture. I don't have a picture that actually has it assembled. Yeah, I'll send you a picture. So this is a picture of the valve. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it because Andre will say a lot about it later. But this attaches to the neck of the balloon where the gas is. And basically it's like a servo that just closes and opens it and the gas comes up. So I'm not going to say too much about this because some things might change and whatnot. So I'll just leave it at that. Here's another valve picture because it looks really cool. <laughs> now, does anybody have any questions about valve valve? Because we kind of went through it quickly, but Andre will talk a little bit more later. So any valve valve questions? Yes. Is it completely automated? Um, yes. The algorithm runs autonomously with a set of pre-configured constants. The really cool thing about this is that we have bi-directional satellite communications with it. We can talk to it from the ground. It can send data back to us. Which means that one of the things we can do is change the constants that it uses for its control algorithm. So we can say, yes, you're flying yourself autonomously, but can you fly five kilometers higher, please? And it will read that and it will do it. So we can track optimal winds and direct this way we want. Right. So Valbal does have intelligent automatic algorithms to maintain altitude. So it knows when to ballast and when to vent gas, and it does that on its own. But as Andre said, if we wanted to change like where it's flying or what exactly it's doing, we have a module on the balloon that allows us to send it commands over um, the Iridium satellite constellation. So there's literally like 90 satellites above Earth called the Iridium constellation, and we have access to those. And we send commands through those, and they send them to our balloon. Our balloon does stuff. It sends commands. It sends data back to us, and we just kind of know what's going on uh, through satellite communications. So yes, it's autonomous, but we can adjust stuff, which is really cool. So any more questions about Valbal before we go on? No? Right. Cool. So let's talk a little about launches. This is what a basic launch schedule looks like. Our first launch is October 10th, so this is kind of what your October 10th day will be like if you choose to come. We meet at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, <laughs> we meet here, uh, it's dark as hell. <laughs> we meet here, then we drive out, we start driving out, we go get breakfast, usually like, the other place is like McDonald's. <laughs> so we get like McDonald's before we get on the highway. Um, then we wreck the launch site, hopefully around 8 a.m. Uh, we launch balloons two or three hours later, after we got stuff prepared, balloons filled, ready to launch, let them go. Uh, then we clean up and leave shortly thereafter, um, and then we go get lunch and we track the balloons, see where they're going, because we get satellite uh, GPS coordinates from them. Not satellite GPS coordinates. Oh yeah, they are. Okay, yeah. So we get GPS coordinates from the balloons. We know where they're going. So one thing I'll mention. Sorry, I'm sure there's other stuff you can eat, but balloon launch tradition is that we eat pho. Does everyone know what pho is? Okay, cool. Vietnamese soup, like it's awesome. So we get that for lunch. It's like a thing. Uh, if you don't want it, I'm sure there's something nearby you can get. <laughs> um, and then basically, while we're eating lunch, usually the balloons land during that time. It's been about three hours. And so after lunch, we just go to the most recent coordinates and we find the balloons. And then we acquire them and we drive back to campus. 
And right after we acquired them, usually we get our laptop, look at the footage of some of them, like right at the cars and stuff. And we come down to campus. Usually what we'll do is you guys can go get dinner after, after the launch, and then we'll send an email saying we're gonna have a debrief meeting at like seven o'clock in Durand. You guys will come here and we'll look at the data, we'll look at the pictures, look at the videos together, just kind of all that stuff. So this is a typical launch. Any questions about the schedule, what your day might look like, what you have to do? Nothing? The Valve launches are somewhat different. There's another there's slide for that. Oh, is there? Yes. There so is. this is a typical launch. There'll be very few of these. <laughs> Um, because Valbal is like our main technology, so a lot of launches will be featuring Valbal. This is a launch that has, doesn't include Valbal in it. This is like a normal balloon, launch stuff on it, it pops, you get it. That's a normal launch. For Valbal, it's a little bit different. For Valbal, it's like this. We meet at like 4 p.m. somewhere on campus. Um, we drive to the launch site. We'll get there in about an hour and a half. Uh, we launch Valbal when the sun sets. The reason for that is to avoid the UV degradation of latex. We want to launch at night so that we have a full 12 hour cycle of no UV hitting the balloon, and that helps the endurance. Uh, so we'll launch when the sun sets, then we'll pack up and leave the launch site. We'll arrive at a hotel, which is the same hotel we go to every time, it's in Manteca. Um, the reason we go there is because it's a sauna and a steam room, which is gnarly, right? So <laughs> then um, shortly after we arrive at the hotel, uh, we'll go get in and out, uh, we'll leave at the hotel or something. Uh, then we go to the sauna. <laughs> for those of you who want to do that, I go to the steam room, right? Um, then from 11 p.m. to 9 a.m., some crazy people stay up and track the balloon. <laughs> I sleep. Um, then we drive back, and they keep tracking the balloon. <laughs> and then we get back to campus, and with Val Val, the reality is, probably spend the next like three days tracking the balloon. <laughs> so uh, this is really fun. Um, hotel lights are really cool, and uh, keeping back, like last, for this Val Val flight, the last one, we got back and then I left, but like Andre and Ari were just sitting in brand or like tracking the balloon for like the next yeah. like day. 36 hours at least I was awake and I landed <laughs> at 6 p.m. the next day. Yeah, so about my launches are really fun and they're long like this. Uh, we'll talk more about like some launch specifics, meaning like even though Valbao launches have this schedule and normal launches have the other schedule, we will be incorporating normal launches into Valbao launches, meaning we'll launch Valbao and it's supposed to go far and we'll track it but we'll also launch normal balloons and retrieve them on the same day. So it'll be kind of like a hybrid. And the reason for that is so we can test Valbao, like long distance platform, and also test new technology on smaller balloon launches all at the same time. That's kind of the idea. So, um, <laughs> what follows this slide is about 10 slides of really weird pictures <laughs> that I've chosen to include of what launches are like. Some of them are really dumb. Oh the first oh. <laughs> so we eat shrimp. <laughs> so the last launch, we had a lot of food. We were just eating it, and he likes shrimp. So he's <laughs> we work out. <laughs> we left these like 60 kilogram gas cylinders out of the truck and carry them for about 10 feet. So not really, but <laughs> we we so yeah. So we do that. <laughs> Swag out! No, I don't know. This is a team picture from the last launch last year, SI-19, uh, 2021. This is our launch. This is SI-19. This is SI-21. This is, Val -Val. This is SI-21. Um, and that's just us at our normal launch site. So that's crew. Uh, next. You know this already. We fa. Uh, that's cool. Alright. We eventually do launch balloons. <laughs> after we do all that other crap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't sleep, which you've seen in this picture. So it's, that's, you can see like that's SSI 19, 20, and 21, how far they've been into flight. That's a map of where the balloons currently are. So you just sit at a desk and